News of the Times. Murderous Mondays. The Great Coram Street Murder Mystery. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1872 Brunswick Square in London. Great Coram Street is rocked by the bloody murder of dancer Harriet Buswell in the early morning hours of Christmas Day. Harriet, who the previous day had sold some of her linen to help pay her lodging fee, has had some dancing jobs, but not enough to sustain her. She was known to prostitute on the side. This dramatic case seemed initially to be easily resolved, but such was not the case. We investigate this tragic Christmas Day mystery of 1872 for today's episode of Murderous Mondays. We hope you enjoy the show. On Christmas Day in 1872, the lifeless body of Harriet Buswell, known by her stage name Clara Burton, was discovered within the confines of her residence at 12 Great Coram Street in Russell Square, London. Harriet eked out a living as both a dancer and a part-time prostitute, all in support of her eight-year-old daughter. Tragically, Harriet met her demise on her own bed, her throat gruesomely slit, and her body bearing several additional lacerations. The room bore witness to a nightmarish scene, saturated in crimson. From the Oxford Journal, the 28th of December, 1872. Horrible murder on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, a shocking murder was discovered to have been committed at number 12 Great Coram Street, Brunswick Square in London. The landlady of the house is a Mrs Wright, and from her statement it seems that the victim is a woman supposed to be about 27 years of age, named... Clara Boswell, whose parents are said to live in Berkshire. About three weeks ago, the deceased engaged the back room on the second floor for a week only, but she occupied the apartment up to the time of the tragic occurrence. Shortly after taking the room, the deceased spoke to the landlady in reference to a little girl of whom she was the mother, who is eight years old, and whom she wished to be taken care of, and Mrs. Wright recommended a person in whose care she had placed two of her own children. From conversations which have taken place between the children, it appears that the deceased was a ballet dancer and, to quote her own child's words, danced in pink silk dresses at the Alhambra. The unfortunate young woman usually returned home about half past twelve in the early morning, and it was near that time that she entered the house on Christmas morning. She let herself into the house with a latch key, and soon after her arrival she communicated to a female lodger in the house named Nelson that she had a foreign gentleman upstairs, and afterwards begged some stout of the landlady, a portion of which she drank and took the remainder away. It transpired that the gentleman gave the deceased a half-sovereign, which she handed to the landlady in payment for rent, and received a shilling change, which she put in her purse. Nothing further seems to have been noticed until the son of the landlady took up the deceased breakfast on Christmas Day at about half-past when he was unable to obtain an answer to repeated knocks at the door. The young woman, Nelson, then went up and found the door locked, and a forcible entry having been effected, the horrible discovery was made. The deceased was lying in bed entirely covered by clothes, and on removing the sheets it was found that two wounds had been inflicted in her throat, 
from which blood had flowed profusely. Dr. Murphy of Great Coram Street was at once sent for, and expressed an opinion that she had been dead some hours. Superintendent Thompson of the Hunter Street Police Station, with several detectives, was soon on the spot to investigate the tragedy. The deceased is said to have stated that she had met the gentleman who was a foreigner in Russell Square, and it has been ascertained that he purchased some fruit for her of Mr. Andrews the, fr the fruitier in Marchmont Street, some of which is now in the possession of the police. It is clear that some person left the house at about six o'clock in the morning, and that the unfortunate young woman was murdered. The police authorities do not doubt. The murderer had evidently washed his hands before leaving, as the water in the washstand was discoloured with blood. The key to the room door had been carried away, and the police have been unable to find the purse containing the shilling given to the deceased by the landlady. Several letters belonging to the deceased have been found, but none of them have the slightest reference calculated to throw any light on the murder. No trace of the weapon with which the crime was committed has been found. On the eve of Christmas, 31-year-old Harriet had made her way to the Alhambra Theatre in Leicester Square, listening in the streets to the waltz music echoing in the frosty air from the theatre. Later that fateful evening she was spotted in the company of an unidentified man, characterised by witnesses as possessing a mottled complexion and sporting lengthy stubble on his chin. Having escorted him to her lodgings, Harriet's life took a sinister turn. No screams were heard when the deadly deed took place, and a partially consumed apple adorned her bedside table, yet forensic examinations revealed no traces of the fruit in Harriet's stomach. The perpetrator, driven by more sinister motives, had not only taken the life of the young artist, but also pilfered money and earnings from her abode. From the London Evening Standard, the 30th of December, 1872, The Great Coram Street Murder. It is hoped that the police will be successful in apprehending the murderer of the unfortunate woman, Buswell. Nothing had, up to our going to press last night, transpired, showing that they are no nearer the fugitive than they were on the day after the murder. Mr. Superintendent Thompson, having done everything to his mind practical about the desired result, the government issued on Saturday the appended document which has been posted throughout the metropolis and provincial towns. Whereas Harriet Buswell, aged 31, was found with a throat cut at number 12 Great Coram Street, Russell Square, the 25th inst. The murder is supposed to have been committed by a man of the following description, who was seen in company with the deceased on the evening of the 24th, and to leave the house at 7 a.m. on the 25th. Age, 25. Height, 5 foot 9 inches. Complexion, swarthy red. Spots on the face, black hair, no whiskers or moustache, but not shaved for two or three days. Stout build. Dress, dark fitting coat, dark billycock hat. A foreigner, supposed German. One hundred pounds reward will be paid by Her Majesty's Government to any person who shall give such information and evidence as shall lead to the discovery of the murderer, and the Secretary of State for the Home Department 
will advise the grant of Her Majesty's most gracious pardon to any accomplice not being the person who actually committed the murder, who shall give such evidence as to lead to a like result. Information to be given to Superintendent Thompson, the police station, Bow Street, London, dated London the 27th of December, 1872. In addition to this, the annexed list of articles which the murderer is supposed to have stolen from the apartment of the murdered woman has also been circulated. Should fortune attend the efforts of the detectives and secure their man, the following remarkable circumstances might prove of considerable importance at the trial. It will be remembered that during the examination, Dr. Murphy at the inquest on Friday afternoon and Superintendent Thompson asked him a question as to whether he had found any particle of an apple in the stomach of the deceased. The answer was in the negative. There was a small portion of lemon peel, but no sign of apple. Mr. Thompson's reason for asking the question was because he conceived it highly important to ascertain, without a doubt, whether the deceased had eaten any portion of an apple on the night of the murder. We have already stated that she and the foreigner entered a fruitier's shop on the way to Great Coram Street, and he bought some nuts and one or two trifling things in the shape of fruit. When the man was called upon to pay for it, he complained in his broken English that there was not enough for the money. Upon this, the fruitier said, Well, never mind, I will give you this apple in the bargain. The man took the apple and left the shop with it in his hand, the deceased carrying the bag containing the nuts. After the murder was discovered, the police, in the course of their search of the room in which it took place, found upon a small round table the supposed identical apple. It had been bitten only once, and in it, at the marks of three teeth, the centre mark or indentation being considerably deeper than those on either side of his mouth, clearly showing that the person who bit it must have had a projecting tooth. Superintendent Thompson at once took possession of the apple, and has since had a cast taken of it. The indentations have been compared to the teeth of the deceased, but their conformation in no particular corresponds with the marks on the fruit. The inference is, that, therefore, that it was the man who bit the apple and then placed it on the table where it was found and which stood by the side of the chair in which he seated himself on entering the room. There are three witnesses who have given evidence of having seen the man, but only two of these agree in the general outline given by them as to his personal appearance, namely the greengrocer and the servant girl of the house of number 51, Coram Street, which is immediately opposite to the house of the murder. Fleck, who is a plain-spoken man, says he knew Harriet Bushwell very well by sight, her having frequently been a customer of his when she resided in Regent Square, close by his shop. Although he never before saw the man who was with her when she last visited his shop, this occurred a little before one at Christmas morning, his shop being open unusually late on account of the time of the year. He had several large and powerful burners still alight when Harriet Buswell and the man came into his shop. She went inside and stood a little while, meditating what to buy. Fleck, meanwhile, looked out towards the street, full in the face of the man, on whose face the light shone brightly. Fleck says he could swear to him amongst 
thousands and describes him distinctly as a man of middle height, broadly and squarely built, wearing a low round shaped hat and dark clothes of a common kind. On this point he is very minute. It was not a great coat, but one that was short to the thigh or thereabouts, with the pockets cut front and fitting loosely. His face was heavy in expression, free of beard and whiskers or moustache and unshaven, and in Fleck's own words, he looked capable of anything. He had no red pimples or blotches on his face, but his cheeks were thickly spotted with black marks, commonly called, as Fleck says, maggots. Having chosen some fruit, Harriet Buswell turned to the man and said, My dear, will you buy me some grapes? I should like some. He gruffly replied, No, whereupon she did not press him, and asked Fleck what there was to pay. He named the sum which was trifling, and the man handed over the money. A few words then passed between Fleck and the man as to the quantity of fruit not being sufficient, and Fleck gave him an apple, and the man and his companion left. Fleck is firm on this point, that the man spoke with a decidedly guttural, or, as he says, German accent. The corroborative evidence as to the personal appearance of the man is that of a, the servant girl of number 51 Great Coram Street. She says that she particularly noticed the man who left the house opposite on the morning of the murder and upon hearing of the murder on that day, she at once went to the police in Judge Street and gave information of what she knew. She declares that she distinctly noticed the man and, in, in her own words, for some un, unaccountable reason, she took great notice of him. He was dark-complexioned and wore a hat and clothes as described by Fleck. He carried a walking stick. He did not appear to be flurried the least, and quietly pulled the door to. Walking towards Marchmont Street, she could swear to him anywhere. The landlady of the house in Argyle Street, where Harriet Buswell formerly lived, has been closely questioned, but can give little information as to the girl's foremost acquaintances, likely to identify any one of them with the supposed murderer. The emphasis in the papers regarding a mysterious foreign man who had slaughtered a single mother on Christmas Day created a backlash in some communities. There are several letters to the editors from various foreign gentlemen making written testimonies in the papers to state that it is not them and that they had an alibi. One such suspect was a German doctor by the name of Gottfried Hessel. The police are convinced that they have their man, but despite five independent witnesses corroborating the description of the man who had accompanied Harriet Buswell on the fateful night, Dr. Hessel is not picked up by any in police lineups after police lineup. The daughter. The daughter's particulars are also picked up in the papers. Her story, in addition to the tragedy she has experienced with the slaughter of her mother, is sadly not so unusual for the time. From the London Evening Standard, the 31st of December, 18. 72. The Daughter A woman of respectable appearance attended at Bow Street yesterday afternoon to make an application to the magistrate. The applicant alleged that she had adopted the child of the poor woman who was recently murdered in Great Coram Street. She, the applicant, 
received a payment of six shillings a week when the child was only a few months old, but during the past four years she had received nothing and had adopted the child, having conceived an affection for it. A short time ago, the mother wished to have the child back, and the applicant reluctantly gave it up. Since the murder had been perpetrated, the applicant went to the landlady at Coram Street and requested the child to be delivered up to her. And although the child commenced to cry and showed an anxiety to go, the landlady refused to give the child up until the debts of the deceased woman had been paid. The applicant wished to know what course she could pursue. Mr. Vaughan informed the applicant that he had no power to make an order and advised her to apply to the relations of the deceased. On the 1st of January, Harriet Buswell was buried. Her brother and sister were in attendance. The police seemed no closer to catching the killer, despite Harriet and the mysterious foreign gentleman having been seen outside the Alhambra and walking the streets together in Leicester Square by several witnesses who have come forward. The inquest takes place on the 4th of January. In general, it is agreed that the probable murderer was the foreign gentleman previously described. Hard questions are asked about Harriet herself and her living, and it is ascertained that Harriet had worked as a part-time prostitute to support herself. Questions arise as to whether her death was self-inflicted and her poverty is noted. The doctor is firm that Harriet could not have killed herself. From the London Evening Standard on the 4th of January, 1873, adjourned inquest. The landlady attests that she went up to the deceased room on Christmas Day and broke open the door, and on turning down the clothes, she found the deceased covered with blood and thought she had cut her throat, as she had tried to do so once. Deceased Harriet Buswell had told the witness that she had made an attempt upon her life about a week before she took the apartment. She had a scratch on her throat, and told witness she had the instrument upstairs, which was since found by the police, a lancet. About a week before her death, she said she was tired of her life, and if she had any laudanums, she would have taken it. The coroner to the doctor, It is quite impossible that she could have inflicted the wound upon herself. The doctor, Quite impossible. By the jury, Could anyone not say if the deceased gained her living by prostitution? Witness knew that the deceased had pawned some underlinen on the day previous to Christmas Eve in order to get money to pay for her child. From further investigations, it is definitely determined that the foreign gentleman is a person of interest, with five corroborating witnesses attesting to seeing the couple on the night in question. Descriptions have been placed up and down the street and across the national headlines. All that is waiting is for someone to come forward to identify the man. The government increase the reward for information to £200. And then the case goes cold. Edward Murray, who had once cohabited with Harriet, is questioned, but he has an unimpeachable alibi and also does not fit in any way of the detailed descriptions of the mysterious man who had been with Harriet on the night of her murder. In May, the case seems to have been left unresolved, and there are no further news reports regarding Harriet. Legend has it that Harriet's spirit lingered within the walls of 12 
Corum Street for years following her tragic end, haunting the premises with an unresolved spectral presence. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, the great Corum Street murder mystery. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories of a similar theme, such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.